Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're very welcome today to our second webinar in our Green Transition webinar series for 2024, which is on sustainability standards and how to get one step ahead of legislative, regulatory and social change and how these standards will help you in terms of achieving your sustainability goals. So today's webinar is being recorded um, and we will share the recording and the slides afterwards. Um, we will also have time for Q&A at the end. So at any stage during the webinar, please feel free to, to input your questions into the Q&A and hopefully we'll be able to address those at the end. So my name is Kathleen O'Regan. Um, I work in the Sustainability and Renewable Energy Department in Enterprise Ireland. And I'm joined here today by my colleague, Anku Shearsat. And we are hosting today's webinar um, with or in collaboration with uh, Caroline of CG Business Consulting. So last week's webinar focused on how to develop a sustainability strategy and action plan. And if you missed it, the recording is available on our uh, website, on the Enterprise Ireland website to watch back along with previous webinars. The main focus of today's webinar, as I mentioned, is on sustainability standards and how these standards can help companies stay ahead of the changing customer requirements and the changing regulations. And in particular with the re reporting requirements of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. So these standards are mandatory for large companies and listed SMEs. And while they're not mandatory for, for most SMEs, for non-listed SMEs, they will, SMEs will be directly impacted by the CSC or the reporting requirements, as large companies are required to report on not only their own operations, but also their, their supply chain and their value chain. So even if your company is not in scope um, for the CSRD reporting requirements, these standards will still be very relevant to your business in terms of implementing best practice across the, you know, the E, the S and the G, the environmental, social and governance. And they will help you to meet your, your customer and your other stakeholder requirements. And they will also help prepare you for other regulations that are, that are coming down the tracks. For SMEs that are starting out on their sustainability journey, EFRAG, which is the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, who developed the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, have also developed draft voluntary standards for SMEs. Now, these draft standards are undergoing a public consultation period at the moment, and they will be finalised shortly. But the objective of these standards is to help SMEs provide the information that will be required by large corporate customers and other stakeholders, including investors. Now, they are just a starting point, so they are very applicable if you are, you know, at the start of your sustainability journey, they are a good place to start. But we are finding that companies are being asked a lot more information, and, and we've come across SMEs um, in multiple sectors that have been asked by their uh, customers to commit to the science-based targets, to provide carbon footprints of their, of their products, to provide environmental uh, product declarations for the products, which is an output of a, a life cycle assessment. So we are seeing companies being asked more and more information and are at risk then of not being able to submit for a tender if they cannot pro not provide this information. But the voluntary standard that I mentioned is a really good starting point because it does list out sustainability matters across the, the EES and G. So it helps to identify you know, areas perhaps then that you should focus on. And we'll provide a link to this in the chat. Our webinar next week will be focused on using voluntary standards to align to net zero. Um, and our webinar the following week will be about how to calculate scope three emissions. So these topics are not included, or are not included in a huge amount of detail today because they will be covered off in, in the following webinars. Today, we are joined by Caroline Gagan, who is CEO and founder of CG Business Consulting. And Caroline will show how sustainability standards can help your company meet its sustainability goals. And we will, Caroline will facilitate a panel discussion with Annette Cantwell, who is Technical Manager of Jew Valley Foods, and Caroline Ashbrady, who is Commercial Director of Core Insulation. So we're delighted to have two Carolines and Antoinette um, here today. But before I introduce our speakers um, further, I would just like to highlight that we do have places um, available on our up upcoming Sustainability Kickstarter workshops. Um, and the dates are given here on the screen. So this is a three hour online workshop. It's aimed at SMEs, uh, business leaders, to help them understand the principles of sustainability and to integrate sustainability into their business strategy. It's designed to be an interactive session and there's numerous breakout rooms where you can collaborate then with peers across different sectors. Um, about 300 have attended the workshop so far. These were launched last October and um, they're, you know, we've had really good positive feedback um, from people that have attended. 
Um, so look, the workshops, um, if I haven't mentioned already, are free to attend and they're open then to Enterprise Ireland, Udras and local uh, Enterprise Office client companies. So you can register for the workshops on the Enterprise Ireland website. So we are really happy to have Caroline um, here today. And Caroline, as I mentioned, is the CEO and founder of CG Business Consulting. And Caroline um, is dedicated, I suppose, to empowering businesses to embrace sustainability as a driver of long-term creation, resilience, and positive social change. Caroline is a seasoned professional with over 20 years experience in ISO and sustainability management systems, corporate so social responsibility, and environmental management. As a passionate advocate for sustainable business practices, Caroline has dedicated her career to helping organizations integrate environmental, social, and governance, ESG principles into their core strategies to drive positive impacts on society and the environment. CG Business Consulting is an advisory firm helping organizations to develop, articulate, and execute their ESG and sustainability strategies. Their work includes sustainability and performance reporting and supporting under various ESG frameworks, strategy development, or conducting materiality assessments. By doing so, they help businesses meet their disclosure compliance requirements like CSRD, but also help them proactively communicate their strategy to other stakeholders like investors, customers, and, and local communities in which they operate. We are also delighted to have Annette Cantwell, who is technical manager of Jew Valley Foods and an Enterprise Ireland client company. Jew Valley Foods is Europe's largest and leading cooked bacon manufacturer. Annette is technical manager for Jew Valley Foods and has worked with Jew Valley Foods for over 16 years and has over 20 plus years experience in the food industry. At Jew Valley Foods, Annette is responsible for quality assurance, technical food innovation and new product development. And in recent years, Annette has the responsibility for implementing Jew Valley's sustainability strategy. We're also very happy to have Caroline Ash Brady, who is Commercial Director of Core Insulation. Core Insulation is a well-established Irish EPS insulation solutions manufacturer. And EPS is Expanded Products Diary, for, the, for those that don't know. Caroline has been the Commercial Director at Core Insulation for nearly two decades. As Commercial Director, Caroline is responsible for ensuring that companies supplies customers with the products and services they need to meet their insulation requirements. Caroline is passionate about quality, a key aspect of the business, and continues to be motivated and excited by the opportunities that exist to construct super energy efficient buildings in Ireland. As a graduate of DCU, Caroline has obtained an MSc in strategic procurement, a postgraduate diploma in public relations um, from Fitzwilliams Institute um, and a degree in marketing and management from DIT. So Caroline is also a certified Passive House consultant with the Passive House Institute and the current chairperson for the Passive House Association of Ireland. So I'm going to hand over to Caroline now, um, Gagan, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. As I mentioned, we'll have time at the end for Q&A, so please do put questions into the chat at any time during the webinar, and we hope you'll be able to answer them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Caroline Gagan, and thank you for that warm introduction, uh, Kathleen. Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Enterprise Island for inviting us here today to be part of their Green Transition Series. And in today's webinar, I'm going to delve into sustainability standards and try and demystify uh, what sustainability is and how, and how you can apply ISO standards as part of your journey, and also to highlight their real importance as vital tools for you um, as a business to showcase your commitment and your transparency and your credible business practices in the pursuit of your sustainability goals and agenda. And I'd like to express appreciation also to Caroline uh, from CORE and to Annette from Jew Valley Foods, who are joining us today as panel experts. And um, I'm very excited for them to share their insights and their experience regarding how they've went about implementing their sustainability uh, management systems, their standards, uh, how they collated their strategy, and they give an overview of their journey, their benefits, and discussing how these standards fundamentally have really helped them stay ahead of the curve. Um, so we were established uh, back in 2009. We're celebrating 15 years in business since July. And over the last 15 years, we've been very, very lucky to have worked with over a thousand clients in Ireland, the UK, Spain and America, helping them implement QEHS and sustainability management system standards. Uh, we have a team of over 20 sustainability and ISO experts. We're ISO certified ourselves. We practice what we preach. Uh, we've also done our carbon footprint, got a third party verified, and we've just recently become a great place to work certified business to demonstrate our commitment to our staff. 
Um, we have grown the team to 20 ESG and ISO experts due to the demands of ESG and sustainability requirements um, driven by CSRD. And uh, we've dedicated energy and sustainability division, which is led by Sarah Kent, who's our sustainability director, and Noel Conaty. Sarah holds the distinction of being one of our, Ireland's first female certified energy auditors with the SAI. So she brings over 20 years experience to our clients from our various sustainability roles. Uh, Noel is also part of our senior leadership team and he leads our sustainability endeavours and he brings a wealth of experience with two master's degree, one in energy and the other in environmental. And he's got 12 years practical experience in ISO. Our mission really is to be a driving force in the operationalization of sustainability. And we really help organizations execute their sustainability strategy one step at a time. And we're able to do that with our technical expertise and how to help businesses address their environmental health and safety, energy risk and social issues. Um, as Kathleen mentioned uh, today, that we are going to be exploring sustainability standards. And my, my aim really is to show you how to construct a successful ESG program and execute it using ISO standards. Now more than ever, there's an urgent call for businesses to really enhance their sustainability cred credentials. You can really see today that the legislation is going to be a real drive. Is it the driving force behind this sustainability uh, drive? And 2023 officially marked as the hottest year on record um, and there's a pressing need now to really address climate crisis and the transition for all of us to transition both in business to a more sustainable way of living and doing business on a personal and a business basis. So I wanted to kind of kick off the webinar now and really delve into sustainability and ESG because these are terms that are being banded about and I just think it's important that when you're starting out in your sustainability journey you actually understand what is sustainability and what is ESG and how are they interlinked. Um, for sustainability, there's a number of definitions, but the most widely quoted definition of sustainability um, is defined as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This quote was termed back in 1987 as part of the Brookland Commission report, but on a more basic level, it just means that people are meeting all people's needs equitably and fairly while operating within the limits of the world's resources and ecosystem. And this is basically how we're going to preserve sufficient resources for generations to come. In a business context, sustainability means different things to different entities and businesses. It's really an umbrella term for how to say that we're actually doing good, that we really have good ethical and responsible business practices. You'll hear a lot of terms like um, we're net zero, we're working towards net zero, we're carbon neutral, we're climate neutral, we've done our carbon footprint, we're conserving our energy, we're managing our water and our resources through circularity, um, we've got diversity and inclusion policies and procedures and we protect um, our workers through health and safety and so forth. They're all really good methodologies of how people can actually express that their business in a business context, they have sustainability initiatives. But people often assume that sustainability is just limited to environmental issues, but it's really fundamental that you understand that actually sustainability is interconnected with economic and societal drivers. And this slide deck here shows you how they're all interlinked and mutually dependent on one another. Um, we're all aware that human activity, all the human activity associated with the economic growth has accelerated climate change. But then on the other side, the climate crisis disproportionately has affected the marginalized groups and low income countries who are not equipped to deal with the consequences of the climate induced weather. Um, a lot of you would have also heard about the triple bottom line and the triple bottom line is people, planet and profit. And this is another key term that falls under the sustainability business practices. Um, this term was um, derived in 1994 and it was intended really to strengthen corporate alignment to and bring transparency around the true cost of doing business. And the idea really looks at how um, people can assess a business uh, based on corporate transparency and accountability across how they basically treat their people, how they manage the environment and protect the planet, and also adding profit and governance into the fray. You will hear today from Caroline and Annette, 
how they've implemented green manufacturing processes in both their sites using ISO standards 14 and 50,001 and energy audits, et cetera. But as a result of that in implementation of those green manufacturing processes, they were able to reduce their environmental impact. This led to cost savings, but it also would have improved the health and well-being of the community. This approach not only preserves natural resources, but it also fosters a very healthy society and creates economic sustainability. So you can see that economic sustainability is not mutually exclusive, but rather mutually reinforcing between society, economic and environmental. So it's going to be great to hear some real life examples today and real world examples of the application of uh, organizations using the sustainability framework. So how has sustainability evolved into ESG? Because if you come forward to 2004, um, sorry, in 2024, ESG means something different now to 2004. So the term ESG was, ter was coined back in 2004 by the United Nations Global Compact. And for any of you that are familiar with the sustainability development goals, this concept has evolved significantly since 2004. Um, you can see in 2024 that ESG stands as the guiding framework for businesses now, and that's been driven by CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which I'm sure you've all have heard of at this stage. So ESG really is the guiding framework for businesses, and they, it's used for them to, to address how they're been addressing climate change, inequality and sustainability development. And ESG fundamentally is also used as a framework now by investors. Um, who are actually looking to evaluate the environmental, social and governance aspects of a business that they want to invest in to evaluate their long term viability and company's actions. ESG is important for you to understand because ESG are the metrics now on which organizations are going to be reporting and it potentially will be an area that you might have to report on in years to come. The environmental pillar, which is the, the most popular, uh, focuses on how a company safeguards the environment and how its policies address climate change, uh, carbon emissions, pollution and waste, deforestation, energy efficiency, and electronic waste and equipment. And it also considers the environmental risk and opportunities, which is a key requirement of CSRD. Example environmental metrics, which are on this slide deck, show that people have to report on their carbon emissions and their carbon footprint. They have to give an overview of their reliance on fossil fuels. They have to state what the metrics are in terms of water, waste, energy efficiency. They have to demonstrate climate risk assessments. And they also have to give an overview of their recycling rates and processes and land use and biodiversity. Uh, with regard to the so social pillar, that focuses on how a company manages its people, how it manages relationships with employees, suppliers, customers, and other communities in which it operates. It also addresses corporate policies surrounding human rights, health and safety, data protection and privacy, and gender and diversity. And it considers how social risks and opportunities are also addressed. Various different social metrics that companies now have to report on is their health and safety statistics, their working conditions, their employer relations, diversity and in, in, um, inclusion, supply chain transfer, transparency, human rights, community relations, and product state, safety. And the governance fa uh, pillar focuses on the company's leadership, executive pay, audit committee structure, board diversity, tax transparency, um, its bribery and conjunction policy. And really it considers how internal controls for decision-making and business operations are structured. So ESG, um, the key takeaway for you guys in terms of ESG and sustainability is ESG focuses on the company's environmental, social and governance practices. And there's a suite of met met metrics now that companies need to report on, which was the previous slide, where sustainability incorporates the broader goals of long term um, and longevity of a business in terms of ecological, social and economic health. ES ESG now is a tool with the broader context of sustainability to assess and guide corporate behavior. And organizations such as yourselves are now required to demonstrate your commitment to sustainability and environmental, social and governance. Um, I would like to bring in now my panel experts, uh, Caroline and Annette. So starting with Caroline, can you give me an overview of your journey on ES ESG and sustainability and what were the key drivers? I suppose at the we started our journey quite early you know, back in 2014 and we were very we were working very closely with um, um sustainable energy authority of ireland at that stage 
And we, because we were working so closely with them and because the directives were co coming from Europe, we could see at a very, very early stage what we were going to need to do to ensure compliance. We are based, as, as Kathleen outlined, we are manufacturing for the construction industry and there's a huge amount of legislation and um, which come through our building regulations that um, will it need where our customers need to show um compliance so it was really for us it was we very early on we got a, an insight of what was going to happen we could see the work that we needed to do in order to show compliance there was going to be a lot of work and we started on our journey so we were in some ways looking back i think we got lucky um that we were so connected with saai at that time and got that look into the future and then it just for ourselves as um directors and owners of a family-run business and um, climate and sustainability and the things that we can do around that space are actually really connected and knitted into our value system and so we could bring that our value that part into our work and make key decisions around it so they were the key drivers for us Okay, thank you, Caroline. And Annette, can you share a bit about your um when your company started on your sustainability journey and also what were the key motivations or drivers behind your decision to prioritize sustainability and ESG matters? Okay, so firstly, guys, thanks very much for the opportunity for us to come here today and share our journey. Um, I suppose we're relatively new to this in comparison to Caroline. We started our journey back in 2022. At that stage, we decided as a company we needed to prioritize sustainability, um, ESG, um, and this is really coming from a number of areas. Like internally, we knew ourselves as a company that we wanted it to be meaningful. It wasn't just a buzzword. Um, G Value as a business has been uh, very much sustainable led in the past. We undertook initiatives such as um, recovering fat from our cooking process to uh, power our hot water system. Um, and we knew that we needed to move forward and to invest uh, to unlock new opportunities for us. So innovation is very important to us. Um, efficiency is key to our business. We're running 24 seven and then also kind of a long term value creation. If we looked externally, then we were very much driven by our customer demand. Um, we had seen a huge shift in terms of co customer preference. Um, they really were focusing in on sustainability and looking at the entire supply chain. So they wanted to move back. They want to know where their products are coming from. They want to know it's from a sustainable source. And they want to know about the environmental impact that it has um, on the their product. Um, but in turn, they also give us a competitive advantage at that point as well. I suppose the other two areas that we felt were a big impact was basically the CSDR regulation. So we could see this coming down the line um, and we knew that we had to stay ahead of this and we had to ensure that we were going to be compliant. And this was just to minimize any potential risk to the business. Um, other areas that we looked at then, we looked at our employees. Um, we're very fortunate to have a really good uh, employee base locally. Um, and we see from them that they're interested in this and they they wanted to, I suppose, really do the, the right thing and the more sustainable thing. So we did get a lot of feedback from people and a buy-in from our teams here in Jew Valley. Um, so really, uh, due to that, then we really looked at what we can do and where we think the kind of potential is. So obviously there has to be a financial impact or a reward as well, which we can clearly see through our strategy. Um, and we've looked at innovations such as um, presenting a reduction of our carbon footprint per product. And then this will align with our commitments, but then we'll also give a really good offering and a unique product uh, to our consumer. Um, we've also looked at um, kind of creating tiers of products. So not only would we create a, a low impact product, but we would also then allow the consumer to make the decision whether they wanted to go for a lower product or more value in terms of what they can afford within their process. Um, and to be fair, to do this, we worked with uh, Caroline and her team in CG Business Consulting. Um, we really embraced the ISO 14001. It was our dipping our toe into the water of ISO. 
Um, our background is very much food and GFSI type standards, which are very um, prescriptive. Um, the ISO is, is different um, and we really did um, need the leadership and the framework which came with um, CGBC. Um, so we have ISO 14001. We are working on 14,046 um, certification, which we hope to gain later this year. Um, and it's it's just been, you know, it's been huge for our business and it's really moved forward our strategy towards achieving a net zero mission. Um, I suppose just one other point to make on it is, you know, we have seen in the food industry a move of uh, a lot of our customer requirements and our approval processes moving towards the environmental side. So having a certification such as ISO 14001 has greatly reduced the amount of work that we've had to do um, in terms of preparation for audits. So for example, the, the new Tesco standards, there's a whole section there on environment. However, as we have certification for ISO, that ticked the box um, from that point of view. So it is coming more and more into our business on a, a daily basis. Okay. Thank you for that, Annette and Caroline. So to summarize the real sustainability drivers from Caroline and Annette from a practical business perspective is number one, it's been driven by policy and legal requirements and regulations. Um, number two, it's been driven by customers and it's been driven by employees. And also uh, for other businesses, it's really been um, driven by investors. So in terms of the number one driver for policy and regulation, and this is where I wanted to bring in CSRD. So now you understand about ESG, the environmental, social and governance, our people, planet and profit. Um, and how now this is coming in through regulation and then how it's going to be on a practical level implemented in terms of ISO standards of how you can apply different ISO standards to meet your requirements under ESG. So really the key sustainability drivers are the EU policies, uh, the Green Deal. Um, investors are looking at ESG to the EU, EU taxonomy and SDF, uh, SDFR. And then customers are now looking at um, aligning the, themselves with businesses and brands that genuinely are sustainable and are very transparent and disclosed in terms of what their stewardship is in terms of environmental and uh, circular economy and their and the, how they protect the um, planet. And then equally, um, employees now um, are looking to work for companies that have adopted the ESG agenda. So the in terms of policy, the EU Green De Deal is the policy that's been the biggest policy that the EU have ever implemented in terms of sustainability in ESG. And this is driving uh, European wide all of ESG and sustainability initiatives across Europe. Uh, you, the, the Green Deal basically specifies that the EU wants to become climate neutral or carbon neutral by 2050. And it's introduced a raft of different legislation to allow it to, to meet that target in terms of climate neutrality by 2050. As part of the EU Green Deal, they've also initiated nine different policies. So no industry is being forgotten. No person is being forgotten. It's a whole holistic approach to in the entirety of the EU every business sector, what they can do to contribute towards reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 55% compared to 1990 levels. Um, historically, I think it's really important to understand that ESG space was not was not regulated. The first piece of legislation introduced by the EU was 10 years ago in 2014 with the NFRD, which is the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. In the last five years, there's literally been uh, an explosion of uh, sustainability regulations and disclosure guidance. We all know about GDPR, we know about the Directive of Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, we know about EU taxonomy, uh, CFDR, and also CSRD. Um, and these are all the regulations that are coming from the Green Deal. Um, um, in preparation for today, I just wanted to show you this graph to basically demonstrate how everything has been driven by the EU Green Deal. So the EU Green Deal introduced these all of these policies and the CSRD now is the one that is being transposed into Irish law in June 2024. And that's basically directing businesses to make sure that fall under criteria to implement ESG and to demonstrate their credentials under CSRD. 
So all of these raft of regulations are really the key drivers for all these sustainability initiatives. And CSRD is the principal one of why um, we're here today and why as a business that you have to look at sustainability. So the whole purpose of CSRD in a nutshell is that it's replacing NFRD and it's putting in more stringent requirements on businesses um, for them to report on how they impact on the people and the planet and getting them to basically step up their game in terms of sustainability dis disclosure. And it's providing more stricter and more transparent reporting guidelines. Um, the timeline, so CSRD came in in January, 2023. Um, 2024, anyone that was already reporting under the NFRD started reporting this year on their performance and in line with all the ESRISs with CSRD. From 2025, the companies like the um, um, that didn't fall under the NFRD but have 250 employees, have 40 million turnover or a 20 million euro in assets fall under the criteria for CSRD. And they have to start reporting in 2025 on their performance in 2024. For SMEs here today, if you are listed, there's going to be a criteria that you need to start reporting in 2026, but there is a two year opt out period for 20, 2008. And then from 2028, all non EU country companies with a net turnover of 150 million will have it, or have at least one subsidiary in EU will have to start reporting under CSRD. The CSRD then is basically the framework and now um, they've the EU basically released the European Sustainability Reporting Standards and they came out on the 22nd of December in 2023. And the ESR are basically the reporting framework for, for you to disclose sustainability performance under CSRD. And they focus specifically on sustainability reporting. The, there is ESRSs, there is basically, again, using ESG, they've been broken down into five key standards under environmental, there's four key environment or standards under social and one under governance, and then there's two cross-cutting standards. And it's really important that you understand, you would have heard at the top of the web webinar from Kathleen, that actually they were after bringing out a new a voluntary um, ESRS, for non-listed SMEs. And this document we're going to share after the webinar, but this has basically been developed for SMEs that are here today for he to help you respond to requests for sustainability information in efficient and proportionate manner, and also to facilitate your participation towards the EU becoming carbon neutral or climate neutral by 2050. But also it's really important to understand that a lot of your customers are going to be CSRD um, clients, or sorry, CSRD compliant companies, and they have to go into their supply chain and they're going to be asking you for all of your environmental information because they need your data in order to submit how they're impacting um, in terms of environmental, social and governance, and they have to take into consideration the supply chain. Um, so now you understand that the EU put in the Green Deal. The Green Deal then transposed into law EU taxonomy, SFDR and CSRD. The CSRD is the framework. And then to actually um, to enable businesses to actually report on CSRD, they have released all of these uh, sustainability reporting directives and they've broken it down into ESG. OK, and what I've done for you today is I've actually mapped out how ISO standards the FAR column actually will help you determine and meet your requirements under the ESRSs for CSRD. And then equally, if you're applying the SME um, draft standard, it's more or less the same uh, requirements and uh, ESG requirements that you have to report on, not to the extent of CSRD, but just on a smaller scale. So fundamentally, this I think is a key slide here to demonstrate how you can use ISO standards to help you comply with your CSRD or your ESRSs. And fundamentally, the ISO standards provide different standards to meet different needs, whether it's um, health and safety, environmental, energy management, and so forth. So the under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, they it's not, I just want to make it clear, it's not mandatory for SMEs to report. However, there is a voluntary um, standard for you to consider and this definitely should be looked at by all participants today because it, it has been developed 
and approved and is currently under public consultation review, as Kathleen had said. The whole objective is, is to improve the management of sustainability. It's to provide information that will help you satisfy data demands from your clients or banks or lenders or credit providers, and equally to help you play an intrinsic role to helping the EU become carbon neutral. Um, and we'll be sharing the draft version afterwards. Um, so this is why now I wanted to show you so you know about ES sustainability, you know about ESG, you know about the legislation now driving CSRD, you understand now the ESRS, just on a high level, the ESRS is 13 chapters. Um, and there's more ESRS being released in terms of se uh, sec uh, sectorial or section or uh, specific sector standards being released. They're currently in draft and now there's a new draft one for non-listed SMEs. So where ISO comes in, um, ISO is an independent organization um, that develops and publishes standards for various industries and sectors. And standards provide all of the frameworks, guidelines, or requirements that can be followed for organizations to achieve their intended purpose. Those purposes can basically be a range of activities. Quality for ISO 9001, sustainability could be 14,001, environmental protection, uh, safety 45,001, information security 27,001. There's over 20 different management systems and there's over 20,000 ISO standards available, but specifically in the business world, there's 20 different management systems that you can choose from to help you in your ESG. Uh, programs and looking at for guidance and frameworks to help you implement ESG practices in your organization. But fundamentally, you can see there in that previous slide that ISO standards support and underpin the three pillars of sustainability development, which is environmental, social and governance. And um, also tie into the people and the people, profit and planet through all of their various different ISO standards. Um, in preparation for today, I wanted to just prepare this slide deck to show you that these are the key ISO sustainability standards. And a lot of our clients use ISO standards to help to use as a tool to help them improve their ESG performance. Um, the most popular one is ISO 14001. It's independent verification that you've implemented best practice in terms of environmental management system. You cannot be accused of greenwashing if you have an ISO 14001 certification because you have to get you have to get that completed by an accredited certification body and you'll have a certificate and it implements best practice in terms of how you can manage your environmental impacts and if you refer back up to the environmental pillar all of the various different um, environmental metrics are part of your environmental management system um ISO 14064, um, this is the ISO standard specifically to help businesses quantify and report on your greenhouse gas emissions and removals, and it'll help you also track and report on your uh, plans to reduce your climate impact, and it'll show year on year continued improvement. It's also a standard that can be independently verified, and transparency and disclosure are a key requirement of CSRD, and now you'll have to provide independent verification that your sustainability information and data has been independently independently verified by a competent third party. Um, uh, so ISO 14064 is the ISO standard specifically around greenhouse gas emissions. There are other greenhouse gas protocols, but just in the interest today to keep on the same team in terms of ISO, that you can have an integrated ISO 14001 system for just environmental management, and you can have uh, ISO 14064 for your greenhouse gas emissions and merge the two. Um, the third kind of most popular environmental standard um, is ISO 50001. Um, so ISO 50001 is mandated now as part of the new revised energy directive for, biz for um, government buildings with over 2 million spend. So the government is actually through its climate action plan mandating that 50001 is implemented and certification is achieved equally for SI 426 which would be applicable for CSRD clients. If you're doing energy audits every four years, ISO 50001 um, is an upgrade from just doing energy audits because it's putting framework in place to help you improve your energy efficiency and reduce your energy consumption. And again, um, it's independently verified um, and you're being very transparent in terms of the systems you have in place and your verification. Um, there's also any series under the 1400, may I point out, is to do with environmental stewardship. Um, so you've ISO 14007 and 14008, and this is a standard um, uh, that's recent, and this standard offers guidance on identifying and documentation, both monetary and non-monetary costs. 
And then we have 14040 and 14044 and we have 14067. There's just a suite of ISO standards, but um, there's the ISO org website. You can go on to ISO um, and look at all of the various different standards, look at all the various different ISO 14001 standards available. The most popular is 14,001, 14,064, 50,001. Um, there's a brand new carbon neutrality standard called ISO 14,068, and there's a new net zero standard. And they're also introducing a new standard called ISO 53001, which aims to provide a comprehensive management system for organizations to contribute to the UN sustainability goals. So um, ISO definitely is an option for people that are on their sustainability journey and it really underpins the ESG um, of um, and sustainability and CSRD. I just want to bring in our panel experts. I'm going to bring in Annette from Jew Valley Foods because I really would like um, the ladies to share today their sustainability journey and fundamentally how they have adopted ISO standards and how that they, they were able to incorporate in as part of their ESG program. So I'm going to hand it over now to Annette. Thank you. So I suppose in terms of our business, we have seen over the last number of years specifically a huge increase in the requests from customers in terms of sustainability credentials. And we found that as part of our journey to get the ISO 14001 and ISO 14064, that this satisfied a lot of the criteria um, and their requirements. So it's a relatively short journey that we've taken. Uh, we embarked on this back in 2022. Um, at that point, we put together our strategy. So we sat down as a leadership te team. We decided what we needed to focus on and how we were going to achieve it. Um, so I suppose really it really kicked off for us in 2023. Um, we decided to invest heavily and we um, built a solar farm, um, which is located at the back of our plant. It's over a 30 acre site. Um, we're heavily dependent on electricity. So we felt that this was a very clear demonstration of our commitment to sustainability and to uh, renewable energy. Um, we also work closely with CGBC, um, and as part of this, then we looked at double materiality assessment um, in terms of the ESG journey um, and identifying our material topics. We also looked at the ISO standards that we needed for this standard. So we got our ISO 14001 certification um, and we also uh, completed the solar uh, farm installation um, and that went into operation in November 2023. So um, quite a busy year, achieved a lot in that year, um, but we very much are kind of looking forward as to what else we need to do in terms of um, our, our sustainability journey. Um, so we're, this year we're working on our carbon footprint um, with ISO 14064, and we're working with um, Caroline and her team. We successfully retained our ISO certification this year as well. And then we also completed our first CDP su submission uh, this year. So again, um, we're just taking a lot of steps forward on our journey. Looking down the line, I suppose one of the key things for us is to look at how we can, I suppose, create a unique point for ourselves. And that will be uh, embarking on the ISO 14064. And this standard will allow us then to quantify the carbon footprints of our products. And that's so important for us because it will give us a competitive edge. Um, our market is really competitive at the moment um, and for us it's really important that we maintain our edge and maintain our position as market leaders. So doing so will achieve a lot of our customer expectations. I suppose in terms of our journey, I mean, I just feel like, you know, we really had to focus on this as a company and we really had to commit to it. Um, it's using the advantages that you have. We had the, the advantage of having the land here on site to um, have a solar farm, which had a, such a big impact. Um, and then it's using the right partner to get that information. So we're very glad that we partnered with um, CGBC on this journey because it's given us the framework that we need um, to create the, the sustainability strategy for our company. Thank you very much, Annette. And now um, I'm going to um, ask Caroline um, from CORE to bring us through her ISO journey and uh, how she how she developed her net zero roadmap. Um, thank you, Caroline. So I suppose as um, an SMA, we were 
and many people on the call today might be SMEs and a lot of the stuff being talked about and what's happening and the speed and all the acronyms and it can feel really quite daunting when you're looking into this journey and how to get started so for us we started we started on well you know what was our end goal each year and ultimately we want to get to net zero um, but we started thinking we're a manufacturing plant. We have we use a lot of energy in terms of kilowatts. And we just started to say, OK, how do we reduce the kilowatts? The first place we had to start was really determining how many kilowatts we use, how what sort of an impact we are having now. And we we were using structures um, just gathering the data inside within the organization um, to get a benchmark of where we were now. We were up. We had implemented our ISO 9001. We had 45001, which was around health and safety. And we had the environmental management system with those three suites coming together. And then we st what we started doing was we started saying, what is our biggest energy user? And what can we do? So we tracked through the entire plant. So because we're in manufacturing, sometimes it can feel easier to achieve this because we do use a lot of energy. And um, so we started looking at each machine, how much energy it was using. And we had a lot of plant. We're 27 years in business. So we had plant that was coming to end of life and needed to be upgraded. So we set a plan for um um replacing our plant with um much more energy efficient kit. We then started looking out into the marketplace to think, well, where can we get money to help us do this? We're enterprise, we use supports from Enterprise Ireland, but we also um, look to SEAI and they, through the communities program, which is still a program that works, we were able to get significant funding to um, for, for our energy efficiency upgrades. Once we were able to prove that the, the, work that we were doing would lead to an energy performance upgrade. The great thing about these grants are there are outside de minimis, there's a block exemption. So we got, we managed to get hundreds of thousands of euro to support what we were doing that did not impact our de minimis. And so there are things out there that companies can do. We then have, because we were, um, we could we were gathering our data and we knew that an environmental product declaration was really important to us and was going to be critical in the construction industry because that's like your stamp that goes into the designers that feeds into their sustainability credentials and the buildings that they're building and because our products are going into buildings we're part of that building block we then moved on and we were saying, well, OK, well, let's put in a, a management um, system um, uh, into the organization. That's when we started looking at 50,001. In tandem with that, we did our scope one, two, and three and working towards um, certified greenhouse gas emissions. And we are this year, um, we're at the end of the process of getting certified to 14,064. So why that's important to us is the information we're giving, so much talk about greenwashing, we supply and want to supply as an SME into the large corps in the construction industry. And they have a different set of buying and procurement requirements than smaller builders do. And we understood to be within their supply chains, we had to have third party verification. And so that was incredibly important to us. But what what it really means, like, you know, it's to be in the supply chains, to be seen to be there. But when we um, when we started implementing the 50,001 and we got the help of Enterprise Ireland through their Green Start Plus program and um, we also um, got supports for monitoring equipment we were able to reduce the kilowatt hours that went into every cubic meter of our material by 20%. That's a massive saving. That data then fed into our environmental product declaration. And the data for our product declaration is 77% better than our nearest competitor in the market. And this is where the work starts leading into that, that competitive edge. That's my sales team walking in with this information to procurement, the procurement people in these big organizations. And um, we've then said, we've set a commitment that we don't need to be compliant with CSRD. But look, the reality is, it's 2024, 2026 is around the corner. Um, and 
and so in 2027 it's even it, i mean they're just around the corner and these things in smaller medium-sized organizations take some time because you're doing other things you're doing there's there isn't one person in our organization just committed to us achieving our sustainability goals we don't have a sustainability director and so we're starting now and we've made a commitment that at the end of this year so we're now looking at our social that our people um we're looking at our governance structures and all those parts within the organization to make sure that we can be part of our customer supply chains um, be secure in that, but also to give us an edge, um, a competitive edge. And, and that's that's what we're doing. So we're going to continue this journey. Um, we have solar PV, we have all the things, we've done so much work in terms of, so now we're, it, it gets more difficult at this point. We're looking at our transport, we're looking at HVO alternatives um, to fuel our business. And and this when we get down to this point, um, it is more difficult. The low hanging fruit for us are certainly gone. Okay, very good. And would you feel, Caroline, that the ISO fifty thousand and one gave you the framework to help you with all of these energy efficient yeah. uh, projects? Um, yeah. yeah, it certainly does, Caroline, because it gives us it gives the team the structure and uh, and and the methodology for how to uh, collect the data and, and then because we have our audit every year we're constantly focused on uh, making sure that the data is right we're collecting it and it stays it helps us stay on point um, mm -hmm. and that it doesn't get forgotten about when you know somebody's screaming down the phone for more insulation material that we that we make sure we stay focused on achieving these things. Okay, very good. So you've got a suite of your eyes on 9, 14, 45, 50,001 and 14064. So you've got a suite of five ISO yeah. standard certifications. Yeah. And do you find that, how have you found the adoption of these ISO standards? Like, has it helped you in your ESG performance? Once you have one ISO system in the business, they all kind of, they're built upon each other. They're not, the, once the structure, the initial structure goes in, um, because of how the ISO standards are, and even um, from working with yourself, Karen, how you then link them all together. It's not like it's five cumbersome processes within the organization. They're linked, there's commonalities. And so we have efficiencies around having this many ISO standards. Um, but as we grow, we're gr because the standards are in when we're smaller, as we're growing now, we're just, we're growing with it. Um, I would imagine it's it probably more difficult the larger you get to put some of these standards in because there's such set. But we we grow within the standards now, and and that's really beneficial. Okay, thank you for that. And just kind of the time, and I wanted to kind of thank you, Caroline, and thank you, Annette, for your insightful um, insights. Um, I think the key takeaway here is that to really consider ISO standards as an option uh, on your ESG journey because. Um, as you can see, it provides guidelines and, and, how, and frameworks and how you can manage environmental, social and governance. And also you have to report data. So you have to report in your health and safety stats, your environmental stats and a management system allows you to, to collate that data. And data is key. And Annette will test, test to this. And Caroline, in your greenhouse gas inventory and your carbon footprint, it's all about data, data, data. Um, so on that note, I'm just conscious of the time. So I was going to open up anybody got any questions for us, but I also wanted to kind of let everybody know I've developed, um, we've actually done an analysis of um, the ESRS and the non-listed SME in terms of how you can correlate ISO standards. So um, again, if anybody wants that, we can share that to just let us know. So um, I'll hand it back then to uh, the thank floor. You. Thank you, Caroline. And look, um, we have, a, and we're both Caroline's and, and Annette, look, that was really, really informative um, from for, for ourselves and also I think for, for client companies um, online. So we have a few questions and uh, we might as well just jump straight to them. Um, so the first question, um, 
Caroline Gagan. I think it, I'd say Caroline Gagan because we have two Carolines now. It probably applies more to you. And it is, where does the past 2080 uh, fit with this or is this UK Pacific? So I suppose, look, there are different standards and we've kind of focused on the ISO standards today. And, and, and there's numerous past standards as well, which are UK standards, but I think they are recognised globally as well. And that one is kind of more specific on kind of um, building infrastructure. So is, is there anything, Caroline, perhaps maybe that you want to add there? Yeah, look, for the purpose of today, there's a whole, It's uh, you've probably heard about the terminology called alphabet soup. There's been a raft of EU and uh, American regulations and there's all these reporting frameworks and I didn't want to bring everything in today because it's quite confusing. But I think it all comes back to doing a double materiality assessment, understanding what your material topics are, talking to your stakeholders, your customers, your employers, doing your competitive analysis and looking at what ISO standards, whether that's PASS or ISO or CEN, or EMAS or GRI, it's up to you to determine. It's not fixated that you have to do ISO. It's just the purpose of today was just to educate you that um, on ISO, but definitely as part of your double materiality assessment and your research into your ESG strategy, you can consider um, past uh, 2050, 2060, 2080, absolutely. Sorry, you're on mute there, Kathleen. And today I'll mute and unmute myself. Hopefully you can hear me now. But I think um it is about kind of yeah, what's relevant to your company and it's it's, it's sector and, and and size specific and 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 you know what will help you as well in terms of your, your customer requirements. Um, so we have another question then um, just in relation to actually if a company is part of the European uh, Emissions Trading System, which is the ETS, and about 25 Enterprise Ireland clients are, are, are members of the mm -hmm. um, ETS system, which is a, a cap and trade system for really high large energy users. So it's, the question is, is this an alternative to, to the ISO 14064? So I suppose my understanding there that would probably be the emission trading system would be focused mainly on um, the operation or emissions coming from a, a site or an operations, whereas with 14064, you're looking at your scope one, two and three. So you're including everything in, in terms of your upstream and downstream value chain. But perhaps Caroline Gagan, maybe you want to um, input there. Yeah, the fundamental thing about the EU ETS is that it needs to be independently verified by an accredited verification body, which is 17029. Um, and the 17029 does, does various different schemes, uh, but 14064 would meet the requirements of EU ETS, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, it does meet those requirements. And it's something that comes up actually in conversations with clients now in terms of they want to be audit ready and and and, and uh, there's different courses that companies can do and, and verification. So it's something that mm -hmm. companies are looking at. And I suppose a lot of companies, and as discussed by <laughs> Caroline and Annette here, are using Green Plus at the moment to align to the international standards. And ISO 14001 has been the most common, the greenhouse gas protocol. And then if companies are large energy water energy users or large water users, then they're looking at the, the, the equivalent standards there. Um, so to, to Caroline um, Ash, can you tell us how you were able to get EPDs uh, created and did, uh, did you do the carbon footprint after the EPD? Um, I suppose the best place to start is through the Irish Green Building Council and um, working with one of their, um, their registered consultants and they will give you a framework for the type of data that you have to um, you have to collect. Um, we actually did our carbon fun footprint um, alongside the EPD process. So um, there's a couple of ways you can go about it, but you can also, um, obviously there's uh, like companies like Caroline's company will help you through that process as well. Um, but for us, it was just understanding what data we needed to collect um, in order to get our position. You do need a couple of years data um, to be able to have your EPD certified. We're finding as well, like this is projects that companies are doing under either Green Start or Green Plus. And if your product is more complex, it's a, it, it's a big, it's a more complex then I suppose, yeah. um, calculation. So sometimes it, it is under Green Plus or if you have, you have multiple products. So, um, while the supports aren't about developing an EPD, that can be the outcome, basically. An EPD is an outcome of ca carrying out mm -hmm. a life cycle assessment. Um, the supports can be used to build internal capabilities and being able to use, gather the data, what data you need, and, and mm -hmm. being able to, to produce that EPD or the, the life cycle assessment. 
Um, so there's just a question there actually in relation to the reports required under CSRD and who is the reporting body, where do the reports go to? Um, the reports will have to be um, you know, digital. Um, the reporting bodies, I, I believe, will be in the, you know, the different um, EU countries, but it hasn't been finalised yet as to who the reporting body is yet in, in Ireland. Have you any updates there, Caroline, on that? I don't think that's... Yeah, the, uh, CSRD, all of that is going to come to light in June, 20, in June, okay? Mm. So uh, the Irish government has, till June, all EU member states have to implement uh, CSRD on a local level yeah. and we'll know more information there, but it has to be submitted as part of your financial accounts and uh, we don't know who the reporting body is going to be yet. Yes. We we will we will find out soon, um, and then just a final question here, and we're, we'll be able to wrap up on the hour. And um, it's just can you approx can you approximate? And this is a very hard question, I suppose, because it really does depend on on the company. But how, can you approximate how many hours per week does the employee looking after sustainability in your company spend specifically on sustainability tasks? It seems a company needs an employee with at least fifty percent of the time working on sustainability and all mm -hmm. the ISO standards. So. Um, I, I can answer that, yeah. Kathleen, believe yes, it or not. Yeah. I can actually answer that. We've done a lot of research. When we get asked to, you know, when people are actually ringing us up and asking us, look, can you help us? They really want to know what are the resource commitments from my end? Because it's so critical that the, this these projects are only going to be successful if there's a cross-functional team um, available to work with the consultants to implement these best practices. So it just doesn't fall on one person. But through our experience over the last two, three years, we've actually analysed it. To meet, to do double materiality assessment, to do your strategy, to implement ISO standards, we've calculated between 200 and 300 hours over a year. Okay. But as you said, it is about multi-team. It's not down to one person. No, and it has to be cross-functional team because your data sets are going to be coming from health and safety, environmental, HR, the board. Like yeah. there just needs to be um a number of people involved. And I, just, think I, I suppose to the point as well that um you have the project, if you like, to get the ISO standard in the first instance, and that's all the hours. And then you have the ongoing work related to it but what i would actually say um in our place now everybody works on sustainability and it is it is it becomes knitted into the fabric of every job um so much so that you know in the accounts team how they enter the data that are, that's on invoices into our system will is in a format that um suits our our reporting requirements but like back in the early days when we first started all of this it was the directors and the company were really leading it we were clearing the decks and really getting down into this which means that you have to clear you have to have other people are supposed to do your job and you just you put in the long hours when you're an sme and you push forward and then you start bringing in your cross-functional team and mm -hmm. um, and we've grown like we've grown from when we first started this, we would have had 15 employees and we're up at nearly 100 now. And so our the resources that went in at each phase of our growth were different. Um, so you just yeah, it's hard work. You get into it. And particularly if you're an SME and there's a handful of you in there, it, mm -hmm. it's the day job and and, and the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Annette, what was your experience of time commitment from your side? Yeah, I think one of the key things for us was really having a team. Um, this cannot fall onto one person, one department. So as I said, kind of our leadership team came together in terms of the strategy. Um, and then we looked at how we could implement it. It fitted into, I suppose, the technical role nicely in terms of uh, a lot of our work is in terms of implementing standards. So we had that skill set. Um, and then it was using um, the likes of Caroline and her team to show us how to do it and to create the right framework. Once you have the framework and you have the system set up, there's quite a bit of work in that. Um, but once you have that in place, it should work as long as you have enough people feeding into it. So we would have operations involved. We would have procurement, finance, um, health and safety, HR. So everyone is feeding into the system, um, but without that, it's 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 basically just a, you know a paper exercise for it to be meaningful, for it to work, and to get improvement, you have to have a team effort. 
Absolutely. Look, and I think actually that's a very good uh, very good way to end the, the webinar and a very good question. So, so thank you, Connor, for that. Um, so look, thanks, Caroline Gagan. Thanks, Caroline Ash Rady, and, and thanks, mm -hmm. Annette, um, uh, for, for joining us today. We do really thanks, appreciate everyone. it. So thanks thank very you. much. I'm just going to um, share one or two more slides if my slides will move. They don't. Um, and it's just a reminder um, of our next webinar next week. So it's how to achieve net zero emissions in line with voluntary standards. And then following week, we'll have one to uh, how to measure scope three emissions. We'll have more, more webinars then later on in the year. Our webinars that we had last year um, are shown on here and they are available on demand on the Enterprise Ireland website. So please uh, uh, have a look there. And just like to say thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, Enterprise Ireland has a range of supports from you know, the sustainability Kickstarter workshop to a sustainability leadership program um, to training and consultancy supports to align to those international standards as, as discussed today, capital supports to implement meters to better understand your, your, your resource usage, capital supports to decarbonize, move away from fossil fuel to, to, to um you know, heat pumps, renewable energy uh, technologies, and then uh, a suite of RDNI supports to hopefully develop more sustainable products, processes, and services. So, for more information, please reach out to your development advisor, or you can email myself or Ankush on green at enterprise ireland.com. Or if you're a client of the local enterprise office or UDRAS or IDA, just reach out to your development advisor there. So, thanks very much um, for, for joining. Thank you. Bye bye.